Hello. It's Wednesday, Facebook Live. Brother Dave here. Got a message for you tonight, and uh, we'll get going in a second. Hopefully everything's working good. Seems to be recording. This is on God's Ways. It's titled, uh, The Road to Righteousness. God's Ways. So I'll pray, and then I'll get going. Uh, a lot of things going on here still this week. Kind of a transitional period after uh, getting back from Kenya and uh, doing what we have done. And uh, I'm glad to be back. Just trying to figure out what we're going to do forward, going forward. So let me pray, and then we'll get going. Thank you, Father, for this day. And thank you for all good things, Lord. Thank you for the things that we have and the things that we uh, are looking for. I, I pray, Lord, that you will be with us in the coming days as we're making plans, future plans. In the name of Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. God's Ways, The Road to Righteousness, I subtitled. So uh, we'll just get right into it. Uh, God's ways are not our ways, of course. His ways are prosperous. So um, Proverbs 14, chapter 14, verse 12. There's a way that seems right to man, but the end is the way of death. Our ways can bring death. You know that? Maybe not physical death, but it could also be death and a vision or something that we're trying to accomplish. But his, bring, his ways brings us righteousness, peace, and joy, according to Romans 14, verse 17. As for the wicked and unrighteous, the prophet Isaiah says in chapter 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Hmm. Those that are not righteous, they have not the thoughts of God. Their ways are not his ways. The prophet also said that his word, which goes forth from his mouth, will not return to him void or empty. It accomplishes what he pleases, and it prospers wherever it is directed. It says that in verse 11. God instructs in his ways through his word. Psalms 25, starting verse 8, says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his way. So really, humility is the key. The arrogant and the proud are not going to really receive any instruction. Only those that are repentant will receive it. So one way is of two-way journaling. That can help. But also getting counsel and advice from trusted friends is also quite beneficial for getting instruction. Psalms chapter 18 verse 30 says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all those who trusted him. That idea of perfect is the Hebrew word tamim. Or tamim. It means complete, whole, entire, or sound. His word is so proven, which means it's tried in the fires of the furnace. This removes all the dross from our lives and refines us as pure silver or gold. In 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, For he, is, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That means that you're no longer sinning because you're suffering for righteousness' sake. So his word has been refined to leave us with only that which is valuable and precious. He is also a shield and safeguard, according to this verse. Keeps us from harm or harmful things. Isaiah chapter 30, starting verse 20 says, Although the Lord has given you bread of adversity and water of affliction, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself. But your eyes will behold your teacher. Your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it wherever you turn to the right or to the left. In other words, it rains on the just and the unjust. Good and bad can happen to everybody. We all can experience adversity in our lives. But he is still right beside us if we are tuned into his flow. 
and are willing to receive instruction and correction. In Psalms 23, it says, He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside still waters as part of this, this uh, Psalms. Now, God's voice is most of the time that still quiet water. It is not the strong wind, the earthquake, or the fire. We see him and hear him even in the most ardent of times, however. His ways are tried and true and never fail. They cause no blame. So, we know from the New Covenant, the New Testament, Yeshua perfectly represents the ways of the Lord. In John 14, verse 6, Yeshua said, He is the way and the truth and the life. So many places in the New Testament, we see the early church was known as the way. Multiple times in books of Acts, for instance, it was the way. Hebrews chapter 10, starting verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by new and living way, which he has consecrated for us. Just a second. Entering into the holy place, he's consecrated for us. It's through the veil. And this is to say his flesh, the veil of the temple being like the, his flesh, the flesh of Christ. When Apostle Paul found the disciples in Ephesus, he asked how they got baptized. And they said, John's baptism, which was John's baptism, was for repentance and to believe in the one following him. And that is the Christ. Acts chapter 18, starting verse 24. Now we read, a certain Jew named Apollos, native of Alexandria, Egypt, an eloquent man, it says, and mighty in the scriptures. He knew his Bible. He came to Ephesus. The man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He knew all about the ways of the Lord from the Psalms and from the Old Covenant, at least. And he was fervent in spirit, it says here. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord. He was good, though he knew only the John's baptism, the, the mikvah, they call it, the baptism of John for repentance of sins. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Then Achilla and Priscilla heard him. When they heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Oh, there's more. There was something new that Apollos did not yet understand, even though he had been taught in the ways of the Lord. So there's always something new to learn concerning God's ways. And in this case, Pentecost was the area that Apollos did not yet fully understand before Priscilla and Achilla pulled him aside to explain this thing called Holy Spirit baptism. So there was something that they did not understand. Like in Acts chapter 19, the elders, they were baptized in this way. But they didn't understand Holy Spirit baptism. They heard from, um, they heard from uh, the things that Apollos had said, and they heard these things about baptism, and John the Baptist, of course. And, but John the Baptist said, follow the one after me, whose thongs are... are you know, he's not these sandals or um, modern language shoelaces not worthy to untie. So the end of the law actually leads us to Christ. It doesn't end necessarily, but it leads us to Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. It's again in the Greek, teleos, complete, finished, or perfected, that which is um, complete, when that which is in part. It says that which is perfect or complete, just like in the Hebrew. This word for complete or finished. The scripture has been interpreted to mean, in some cases, the canon of scripture is complete or put together. And that all things will disappear. There will be no more need for divine knowledge or prophecy. 
if prophecies disappeared though from the church um then maybe divine knowledge is also disappeared why are we losing something it says that both will disappear and that doesn't sound right why would god want us to lose knowledge of him or his ways as it said both will disappear if we know in part we prophesy part that which is perfect has come that's in part going to be done away well i guess knowledge will disappear if prophecy disappears hmm doesn't sound right in psalms 19 verse 7 the law of the lord is perfect converting the soul this how mean we talked about it before complete perfect whole sound the law of the lord it's the torah it's the first five books of the bible basically genesis and it's so much law but um the others are now christ is our teacher he is our teacher today actually um he never said we no longer need any teaching. Apostle Paul told Timothy to study to show himself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's important. We've got to divide or understand or even what covenant we're under. Romans 10, 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What does that mean, the end of the law? That teleos does not apply to a law that's obsolete, but it is the destination. Ow. Oh. And the completion of the journey. Ow. Oh. The word teleos, the end of the law. It's the it's the it doesn't mean it's necessarily obsolete, but it's the destination, the purpose, the location, the direction. So it's a sign for those who believe. He's a sign for the world. In Genesis, we see that on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place far off. The place was Mount Moriah. He was to sacrifice his son there, his only legitimate son, at Calvary. God was not ready for that and had to first fulfill his promise to Abraham, which will make you a father of many nations. Abraham was the father of those who believe again, the prototype of those who are to live by faith. John records in his gospel, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Abraham understood that there will be a day when God himself offers up a sacrifice of his only son. Adam, Abraham rather, completed his journey, but was restrained from killing his son. God completed his journey, which led to the same place, Calvary, where he finished the job of offering up his only begotten son, which Abraham was not allowed to do. Apostle Paul quotes right out of the Torah and actually quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14. But the word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. And Apostle Paul says, who will descend into the abyss? It actually says they are to go beyond the sea in Deuteronomy. It's interesting slightly different verbiage. I'm interested and intrigued here because I just did the other day my word of the day and talking about the face of the deep and the face of the waters and how the Lord is showing me something about going beyond the waters is related to that of the abyss, which is a creation mystery as yet for me and others. The idea that the Torah is obsolete is not really correct, however. We read in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, For this is the covenant I will write with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You see, he writes it on our hearts, and he writes it on our minds. And verse 13 there in Hebrews chapter 8, and this he says a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. I believe it vanished pretty much by A.D. 70, when the end of the temple happened. It is not the teachings of the Torah so much that are obsolete, but the covenant of Moses, it says, that is obsolete. Many interpret this as the system of sacrifices used during the Old Testament times. Even the Jews today don't even offer sacrifices the way they did back then. Now, the teachings of the law are part of the covenant given to Moses, of course. 
God says that he will put his laws, though, in our minds and write them upon our hearts. That means we know what's right from wrong. We understand what Yeshua was saying when he told the Pharisees to follow the weightier, weightier matters of the law. Justice and mercy and faith, like Abraham. To follow the rules and regulations says we tithe of mint and dill and cumin, but that is not good if we miss the more important issues. Got to do the more important things first. This new covenant is sealed, though, by the blood of Christ. Romans 3, verse 21 and 22. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Now Abraham believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness says in Genesis 15, likewise through faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ, we also obtain his righteousness. It is no longer through dead works of the law, like the sacrificial system. In Romans chapter 7, it says, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what is held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For what I have known, it says um, covetousness. I would not have known what covetousness was apart from the law. It said, you shall not covet. Therefore, the law is good and holy and still valid. Matter of fact, Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And remember, it says heaven and earth pass away. Check it out. I think heaven, earth's still here, heaven's still there. The law exists, though, for lawbreakers, however. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, but we know that the law is good and if one uses it lawfully. I remember Yeshua was talking about the, the, the weightier matters of the law. Going on, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there are any other thing that is contrary to, to sound doctrine. That's what the law is for. It's not for those that are holy and righteous and doing the best they can for those that don't care and doing wrong. So we're no longer bound by the law in that one sense, but it's not a license to sin. Certainly not. By the law, the knowledge of sin comes out. That's Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3. Apostle Paul half-jokingly speaks about our, unrighte our unrighteousness and evil deeds as a method to demonstrate his righteousness and good. Imagine that. I mean, he was not serious, but he was making a point that if we're unrighteous and we're lawless and we do things, then we're proving that God is just and righteous and good. But there's a word for that, and it's called licentiousness, meaning immoral conduct or practices harmful or offensive to society. It's a big word. There's multiple places in the New Testament that uh, Apostle Paul calls out that these will not inherit the, the uh, kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, and Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, the works of the flesh. They speak about... Uh, the evil that people do, and those that do it will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's pretty clear. It's spoken out against. It's not an if, it's a, a will not. We also understand that when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, they were baptized in the Moses in the cloud and in the sea. We are baptized in the Christ by the washing away of our sins. In baptism, we acknowledge his death, his resurrection. We're baptized into his death. It's also a pledge of a good conscience toward God, doing what we pledge to do what's right and good is the best of our ability. 
Knowledge of sin means we understand we, do, when we do wrong, it might not be even something codified that we can point to as a particular sin. For instance, downloading copyright material, is that sin? It's not in the Bible that way. So actually, if it's not explicitly or implicitly, sometimes it's implicitly um, permitted, then, then the answer is yes, it is sin. There is no Torah teaching or anything in the Bible from Moses or Yeshua that speaks of such things, but we become a law unto ourselves, and hopefully we still have a conscience and hasn't been seared, and we know right from wrong. And we also, let's talk about grieving the Holy Spirit. In Ephesus chapter 4, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgives you. Of course, there is something that we all need to work on. Um, there's certain times when yeah, we can get angry. It says, be angry and sin not, and let the, uh, the sun go down on your anger. You know, we have to be careful about that and what we do and how we react, especially. It's by his spirit that we really understand what is sin. The law helps, but does not cover every situation, like I said, nor does it adequately arbitrate between what two things are more correct. At some point, maybe Moses got further direction from Jethro or from the Lord himself, but it, not all situations are always covered. When this topic comes up about um, arbitrating between what's right, I'm th I kind of think of the ninth commandment Some. Sometimes when it says, do not lie one to another, actually it says bear false witness, but it's consumed a lie. <laughs> now, if I lived or we lived in a fascist or dictatorship, authorities came and asked me if any Jews or innocent people were around. And they wanted to arrest them and persecute them. You know what? I'd lie to the best of my ability, quite frankly. You see, even the Ten Commandments couldn't have an exception in some cases. But remember that with every exception, I've said there's an absolute. All liars, it says, will be cast into the lake of fire. And that's in Revelation 21, verse 8. So lying is a sin, but love, only love, can counter that. And that's love of God. And then, of course, love of man. The, two, the first and second greatest commandment, under, under, uh, according to Yeshua. So love trumps everything, actually. So we realize that the law of the Lord is perfect, complete in what we need. The law has been recast as to what God writes on our hearts and minds. Emphasis and priorities have changed. That what the Samara, Samara, uh, ceremonial law is no longer needs to be practiced. But nothing's really disappeared from the law, but it has been perfected and completed by the work of Yeshua HaMashiach on the cross. So. We have the law written on our hearts and minds, and uh, God testifies and, and, and gives us wisdom and vision on what's the right thing to do. But it's not a license to sin. It's just uh, the law is still there, and it's for lawbreakers. So we need to live right and do the best that we can in all situations. So I'm going to pray and finish up here. So. Lord, I pray that this message is of some benefit to the hearers, Lord, and that you use it to your glory in people's lives and they learn to listen to your spirit. And don't forget your law. Don't take things for granted, but try to live holy lives the best they can. In Christ's name, amen. Till next week, God bless you all.